But now to officially start the webinar, I'm really pleased to uh, invite Sue Weston, Comcare's CEO, uh, to open today's session. Thanks, Andrew, and welcome everyone, wherever you are today. It's a pleasure to open Comcare's first webinar, Navigating a New Normal. First, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting across the country today. I pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the contribution they have made and continue to make across the country. I extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. I also acknowledge the cultures of everyone in the Comcare community and the richness of understanding and perspective that diversity brings to the work we do to promote and enable safe and healthy work. The past few months have seen some radical changes in how we live and work as the pandemic has unfolded. For some states and territories, COVID-19 has followed closely on the back of the summer bushfire disasters. I think we can agree that 2020 has seen unprecedented uh, disruption. And as we continue, it looks like we'll be transitioning back and forth towards what is becoming known as the new normal. We've all had to adapt and shift in the way we work from home or working in another setting or with an increase or decrease in our workload. One thing we have seen is that as a nation, we've needed to work collaboratively. Given the current limitations on face-to-face -face events, this webinar has been developed as an opportunity for us to engage on working with the pandemic. Some key messages for me are that you can't set and forget your guidance to staff and your risk assessments. I can see there's questions already about risk assessments. You need to remain engaged with the evolving situation. You also need to remain engaged with your staff and consult and be aware that the risks may be different in different parts or locations of your organisation. And in the Comcare jurisdiction, employers should notify Comcare of all confirmed COVID-19 cases that are work-related and arise from the business or undertaking of the employer. And Comcare will be checking across our jurisdiction to seek assurances that there are safe systems of work in place. If you are not in the Commonwealth jurisdiction, please check the Safe Work Australia COVID hub for notification requirements with your state or territory workplace health and safety regulator. In this webinar, you'll get a sense of Comcare's priorities during COVID-19, from our approach to regulation to our focus on providing practical and timely information to support um, our diverse jurisdiction. Promoting and enabling safe and healthy work is central to Comcare's work. In workplace health and safety compliance, claims management, early intervention, return to work, our research program, and in supporting mentally healthy workplaces. Collaboration is crucial in supporting public sector and private sector employers and workers in our scheme. I am very pleased to be part of Comcare's first webinar today and I hope you all can take something from it. Back over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Thank Sue. You, Sue. And thanks for the welcome and getting us started. In a moment, I'll introduce our presenters for today, Natalie and Justin. But before that, I'll give you a little bit of background about this webinar. And normally at this time of year, we would have delivered a series of face-to-face -face work health safety forum um, forum activities as a way of engaging with you as some of our key stakeholders. We've of course put these on hold as a result of the COVID-19 situation and now using this webinar as a digital platform to engage with you. The topics and the content for this webinar have been developed from the questions and the queries that we've received from many of you when you registered for the webinar. Some of the questions have also been asked through our call centre, our Work Health Safety Help Desk, as well as some of our, our direct uh, interactions and our stakeholder outreach. Uh, interesting, I'm just looking back at the poll, our thumb poll that we had. Uh, we've got uh, so far 183, 185 now. Uh, people have said that they're viewing from home, or participating from home, and 68 from the office. So we've got uh, at least two to one uh, doing this from home versus the office, which is interesting, and only one uh, from somewhere else. 
So we've got uh, over 300 attendees, over 400 uh, participants uh, joining us live at the moment. We've had registrations from the Australian Public Service, from many of our uh, licensee organisations, from workplace rehabilitation providers. Uh, we've got representatives from other state and territory uh, regulators. We've got a number of unions represented and many others from outside our direct jurisdiction. And we're really pleased to have you joining us today. However, it is really important to note uh, that the information that's provided is aimed for participants within the ComCare scheme and work health safety jurisdiction. So as Sue mentioned, if you're outside of uh, the ComCare scheme and jurisdiction, you will need to follow your state or territory's work health safety legislation and guidance in the first instance. All of the discussions and comments that we make through today's webinar should be considered as general information and advice only. And you need to consider how anything applies uh, or said applies in the context of your individual and your workplace's specific and unique circumstances. Uh, that said, if you are within the ComCare scheme and you do have a specific work health safety question about your organisation's circumstances and you want some advice from ComCare, you can email our Work Health Safety Help Desk uh, the details are on the side on the slide uh, where uh, they'll provide you with a considered response and direct you to appropriate information and guidance. So now let's start by introducing our presenters for today who are going to be answering your questions that you've put forward. First I'll introduce Justin Napier who's the General Manager of Comcare's Regulatory Operations Group. This is the group that's focused on encouraging healthier and safer workplaces through risk-based regulation. In his role, Justin has got oversight of Comcare's inspectorate functions, regulatory policy, work health safety, audits and authorisations. So welcome, Justin. And by way of introduction, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, what's drawn you to be in the role that you're in, and how's the COVID-19 pandemic actually affected you and the work that you're doing? Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and welcome, everyone. So I'm working from uh, from home in Melbourne at the moment and have been since March and by the looks of it may be for some time yet. So that's a pretty significant change in my uh, my day to day routine. I've been in regulatory roles in the Commonwealth Government for more than 10 years, so it's obviously an area that I have a, an interest in and a commitment to. I see work health safety uh, as a fundamental right. No one should go to work and have their health or safety compromised. And our role as the work health safety regulator is important in that context. I'd like to think that the work performed each day by Comcare's inspectors, by our help desk staff, our policy team, our education and engagement people, and our risk and analysis team helps to make the workplaces we regulate healthier and safer. So our work in conjunction with the work that you do as HR professionals, safety people, HSRs, CEOs or unions, is making a real difference. So for me, it's a nice feeling going to work with this as our goal. In terms of the impact of COVID, uh, it's certainly been a very, a very busy time. We've been working with our jurisdiction to provide advice and guidance to help manage the never seen before risks of COVID. We've been working with Safe Work Australia on national guidance, and we've been following up on notifications and WHS concerns, both proactively and reactively, to ensure the COVID risk is being managed effectively. While this has been an unprecedented and challenging time for all of us, there have been many silver, silver linings. And one of those for me is a real spirit across all work health and safety agencies, both federal and state, to work together in response to this crisis. And I think this has been a good thing. So I'll leave it there, Andrew, and uh, welcome again, everyone. Thanks, Justin. And look, we've also got Natalie Beckers here with us today. And Natalie is the General Manager of Comcare's Strategic Partnerships and Engagement Group. This is the group that contributes to enabling healthy and safe work through strategic programs, partnerships, research, engagement, communications, and education. Welcome, Natalie. I wonder if you can also tell us a bit about yourself, what's drawn you to be in the role that you're in, and how has COVID-19 affected you and your work? Thanks, Andrew, and welcome everybody. Great to be here. Um, so I'm Natalie, and I've got 20 years experience working in the personal injury sector. And so I'm, um, I also have a background and I started my career as an emergency nurse. So fair to say I have a bit of a humanities brain and I'm really passionate about the health and wellbeing of people and believe that good work helps us to thrive. Good work supports not only our physical health, but our mental health, and it can have a really positive impact on our families. 
my group here at Comcare leads the sort of research and innovation arm um, here at Comcare where we look to apply and test better practice, working in partnerships with organisations and industry as we look to trial and test new ways around prevention, early intervention, mental health uh, and the like. On a personal note, I too am working in Victoria and um, have been working at home for quite some time now. I'm a mother to two young small boys, so homeschooling is also my life, which is a real challenge, as many of you no doubt already are experiencing. Um, at a work level, we've seen absolutely an increase in intensity to our work as we've had to develop um, and respond really quickly with new guidance, education and support to raise the kitchen as well as partnering and collaborating um, with Beyond Blue and others that we look to uh, to develop new ways of responding to what is ever an increasing need um, during the pandemic. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Natalie. So let's begin to talk about some of the questions that have come in from participants. And the first one's for you, Justin. We've had quite a few queries about the national COVID safe workplace principles. And I'm wondering if you can provide us with some context around where they've come from and what do they mean? <clears throat> Certainly, Andrew. Um, Recognising that uh, COVID-19 is a public health emergency, the uh, National COVID WorkSafe principles were agreed by the National Cabinet process. The principles are designed to prepare workplaces to resume normal operations, and these principles apply to all businesses, PCBUs and workers. Included in these principles is that businesses and workers must actively control against the transmission of COVID-19 by working together to adapt and promote safe work practices consistent with advice from health authorities. These principles were developed to support the nationally consistent guidance, which can be found on Safe Work Australia's hub and complements the national roadmap to a COVID safe Australia. This roadmap is a three step framework to gradually remove restrictions, reopen business and transition workers back to the workplace. As we are seeing right now, different states and territories are in different stages and will adapt as there is a need to respond to an outbreak. Thanks, Justin. So as you know, Comcare's had questions from our stakeholders about the Commonwealth Public Health Safety laws and if they still apply while there's this global pandemic in play. Do those Commonwealth so, uh, Work Health Safety laws still apply? And has there been a change to the duties that fall underneath them? Uh, yes, Andrew, absolutely. The Commonwealth Work Health Safety laws still apply and the duties of PCBUs, officers and workers also remain unchanged. So a few key points here. Uh, PCBUs need to maintain a work environment that is without risk to uh, health and safety. Officers have a duty to exercise due diligence to ensure their PCBU meets its duties to protect workers and other persons against harm to health and safety. So this means, among other things, that an officer must ensure that the PCBU has in place appropriate systems of work and actively monitors and evaluates WHS management. Businesses must, in consultation with workers and HSRs, assess the new risks that have presented and follow the risk management process, which we'll discuss in further detail shortly. PCBUs need to ensure that their policies and procedures are updated and that these reflect the risk management steps that you have taken. And finally, workers also have duties, including taking reasonable care for their own health and safety. We'll cover this a bit more later on, Andrew. <coughs> Great, thanks, Justin. And I've just been asked to clarify for our listeners, the work health safety uh, legislation refers to PCBU, which is person conducting a business or persons conducting a business or undertaking, which effectively means the employing organisation or employer. So for the purposes of our webinar, we'll use the term employer to mean PCBU, just to step away from the jargon a little bit. It's important to note that the Work Health Safety Act does also call out particular duties for the PCBU, which again we'll refer to as employer, uh, but it also has particular officer duties, and these shouldn't be confused as they um, are different, uh, but mutually supportive. So back to the questions. Um, as employers and workers continue to maintain their duties under the Work Health Safety Act, 
uh, to ensure a safe working environment. Justin, can you tell us a bit about Comcare's regulatory approach while we're responding to this evolving COVID-19 environment? Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. So Comcare has been working collaboratively with Safe Work Australia, including the uh, relative, uh, relevant state and territory WHS regulators over this time. Comcare's approach is outlined in the National Statement of Regulatory Intent, which describes the enforcement approach that regulators will take to ensure compliance with the WHS Act during the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of serious incidents and, and fatalities that may occur, for Comcare, it's business as usual, and our approach remains unchanged. It's important to note that employers in the Comcare scheme should notify Comcare of all confirmed COVID-19 cases that are work-related and arise from the business or undertaking of the employer. And I'd like to highlight that for COVID-related issues, where genuine attempts are being made to comply with WHS laws, a supportive and educational approach will be taken by Comcare. Lastly, if a notification has been received relating to COVID, we will consider and address the risks to health and safety according to our standard regulatory procedures. And we will decide whether regulatory action is required on a case-by-case -case basis. To assist you, Comcare has created an e-learn module titled Managing WHS Risks Relating to COVID-19. This can be found on Comcare's LMS system that holds many other online training modules. Great, thanks, Justin. So the key takeaways here, as I understand, is the Commonwealth Work Health Safety laws still apply, including notifications of incidents that take place. Uh, the employers should notify Comcare of all confirmed COVID-19 cases that are work-related and arise from the business or undertaking of the employer. Now, Justin, you mentioned before that employers and their offices need to manage risks to work health and safety. And one of our most common questions that are being asked through our Work Health Safety Help Desk is on management, uh, risk management guidance during COVID-19. Can you tell us how the Work Health Safety Risk Management process applies to COVID-19? Yes, certainly. So employers uh, need to identify, assess, implement and evaluate control measures. The risk management process is the same for risks related to COVID-19. You must assess the risks to workers and others in the workplace. Your risk assessments must or should be reviewed periodically or as the operating environment changes. An example of this could be in response to changes to public health restrictions. The review of the risk assessment needs to make sure there is ongoing appropriateness and effectiveness to managing that risk. Great. Thanks, Justin. So, uh, as employers always need to identify, assess, implement and evaluate our, um, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, it looks like we've got a question that's just come through, trying to read at the same time as uh, ask a question about a few examples of when a new or a review of a risk assessment should occur. And that's great because we actually prepared a slide on this one and it lines up with some of the questions that have been asked through the Health Desk Administration. Uh, so the question is, uh, when a new or a review of a risk assessment should occur? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So risk assessments need to be conducted and or reviewed when one of the following things happens, where a new risk has emerged, when features of the workplace or the nature of the work has changed, when responding to an incident, for example, where a worker has tested positive to COVID-19. When responding to concerns raised by workers, HSRs or others within that workplace. When there are changes to work practices, procedures or work environment. Examples of this might include, for instance, customer aggression in the workplace or a need for work-related travel or high work demand or people working in isolation. Also, when work has recommenced or you are in the process of increasing operations following a shutdown or a time of reduced operations, you need to revisit the risk assessment. And finally, when workers are introduced back into the workplace following work from home or stand down arrangements. Thanks, Justin. That's really helpful. Uh, and as we know, the situation can evolve and change uh, really rapidly. 
and we certainly had more than a few queries about work health safety and consultation. So with the need to respond really quickly at times, is consultation um, always still required? Yes, absolutely it is, Andrew. Like when managing any other workplace risk, employers must consult with their workers and HSRs at each step of the risk management process. The workers experience, their understanding of the tasks involved in their job and their ideas will assist the employer to identify all hazards and choose control measures that are practical and effective. Thanks, Justin. So thanks for giving us that um, overview of uh, the work health safety risk management process and how it applies to COVID-19. We're now gonna move on to discussing some of the more specific hazards and risks associated with uh, COVID-19 and response and some of the things that employers can do to respond. So over to Natalie, I wonder if you can tell us about some of the issues that employers have been presented with and have been responding to during the pandemic. Thanks, Andrew, absolutely. Uh, when COVID-19 pandemic escalated a few months ago, it has required unprecedented and rapid response by workplaces. It's fair to say that not many workplaces today actually look the same as they did at the beginning of 2020. And for many workplaces, the initial response to COVID-19 resulted in significant change in a really short period of time, including the changing place of work, as we've seen, as we've been heard today in terms of our audience today, a huge amount of workers working from home where it can be done or reasonably done. We've seen an emergence of new technologies, such as the platforms we're using today, but also other technologies, as, uh, as well as many new physical and psychosocial risks that have emerged that we really need to be conscious of while working from home, as well as in our usual workplaces. During this time, many agencies and employers have set up remote communication channels, quickly trying to respond and think about new ways to engage their workforce when working from home, to collaborate across teams, and to work remotely, um, like we do here at Comcare, running national, we run nationally, and we have many dispersed and national teams. Moving forward, employers should now be taking a more considered look at the technologies that are available. The processes and I guess the policies, particularly around working arrangements and looking at, at, at exploring and adapting flexible working policies and adapting new business continuity plans to be ready for whatever the future holds. After all, it is 2020 and who knows what's next. Lastly, I just want to highlight some of the principles that underpin the COVID Safe Australia that Justin already mentioned before. So some of these also include, which I know many of us have heard, is around ensuring a safe physical distance of 1.5 metres or four metres squared. Um, I guess for those that live in Victoria, but um, a lesson for all of us across the country is stay at home if you are unwell. Um, and that is something that employers must um, continue to communicate to their workers about. The, the need for frequent cleaning and disinfecting of common areas, particularly for those workplaces that are still working within the usual work environment. And obviously, again, for those that are in Victoria, we have seen the recent introduction of masks when we leave our homes. And that has brought um, both new challenges and risks for us to think about, not only personally, but also um, in terms of workplaces and how we run our daily lives. Um, again, for those outside of Victoria who are transitioning back to the workplace, uh, there is a need to think about transitioning uh, transition plans and COVID safe transition plans will be key to actually returning to safe work. And Justin will cover these um, a little bit later too. Great. Uh, th thanks, Natalie. So you highlighted there's uh, obviously been some big changes for a lot of workers in the workplace. Uh, many individuals having transitioned from uh, working from home. Um, we've certainly seen that in our live poll with at least two to um, every one person who's uh, home. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming through about the biggest risks that are arising um, or related to working from home. Can you talk us through some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Um, there's plenty of physical risks that can be present uh, in a worker's home and these can change over time. It's really important that a home meets the same work health and safety requirements. So it is a requirement that, yes, our workplace needs to meet the Work Health and Safety Act and the requirements within the Act, but so does a working from home arrangement. And so things, um, and it would be physical uh, workplaces, meaning it needs to be a safe workplace um, where appropriate risk management needs to be in place. Individual workers may have different hazards and risks in their workplace and in working from home. 
and, and in a remote setting. Um, so examples of these obviously include workstation setup, um, the environment, lighting, noise, uh, ventilation, electrical safety, as well as there might be some pre-existing injuries that need to be accommodated for not only in the workplace but also at home. As Justin said earlier, it's vital that employers consult with workers to understand and identify what are the risks and, and to also develop their uh, mitigation strategies to manage them effectively. Great. So it sounds like there is quite a bit to think about that we might not have previously considered. Where can an employer or a worker go for guidance uh, materials or support on managing the hazards or risks associated with working from home? Oh, sorry, we've also been um, asked about what needs to be considered if this becomes a longer term or a more permanent arrangement for workers. Have we got any guidelines or guidance around that as well? Yeah, sure, Andrew, absolutely, you're right. There is absolutely a lot to think about. Um, I'm really happy to say that Comcare has been working really positively with key agencies such as the Australian Public Service Commission and has developed a working from home checklist uh, that provides both employers and workers with practical guidance to help them meet their work health and safety obligations, as well as making sure they have a safe environment while working from home. So the checklist is intended to be a practical tool for workers and employers to use to help identify some of the frequent hazards and risks that workers may experience in their home or workplace that needs to be mitigated. So some of these include um, working from home ergonomic setup, uh, free from trips and hazards, the need for workers to take appropriate breaks and to look at healthy work practices like stretching, taking breaks, looking after their physical health and also their posture. Setting up an agreed communication system between employers and workers, which is really critical right now to ensure that work expectations and demands are understood by both the worker and the employer. Looking after workers' mental health is critical. We are hearing, and it's emerging through the research, and absolutely an increase in cognitive load experienced by the increase in screen time. Um, and we really need to be thinking innovatively about using other forms of communication. So maybe having walking meetings while having them on the phone, not always sitting behind your desk um, to have your, your have your meetings. And the other key one is um, the boundaries between work and home and establishing some positive routines that help to prevent that overlap and distinction between when am I at work and when am I at home. So these checklists can be found on um, the Comcare's Web, uh, website. So we have a coronavirus website page um, dedicated uh, to this and so I'm pleased to say that the checklist can be available uh, there as well. And um, perhaps we could do a little bit of a, um, a thumbs up poll, Andrew, on and asking people uh, whether or not they have been and seen these guidance and whether or not they have been to our website. And maybe we could come back to some of those results um, at the end of the um, webinar. The other thing that I want to point out to your second point, Andrew, was around longer term working arrangements. So absolutely, it's fair to say we all kind of thought the pandemic would be over in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's not. And we really need to be thinking in terms of the longer term nature of the pandemic. And so we have developed some guidance around longer term arrangements. We understand that with longer term arrangement, there needs uh, there is a need for employers to think through engagement and communication with their workers a lot more to ensure good work design, whilst also managing the needs and outcomes of the business and also worker productivity. Um, so these documents can also be found on the Comcare website as well. Great, thanks Natalie. So those resources are really helpful. Uh, before we dive into some of the other risks workers might be exposed to uh, in this environment, uh, in fact, I'm just comment on the uh, Q&A feed. Um, so we've had questions come in about access to slides. Absolutely, we'll be um, giving you access to the slides after the session. And thanks for all the questions and comments uh, that are coming in so far. Uh, Justin, we've talked a bit about the responsibilities and employers to provide healthy and safe working environment. Can you tell us a bit about the workers' obligations? It might be worth mentioning also that the Work Health Safety Act's definition of a worker uh, also includes contractors and labour hire, as well as those directly employed by employers. Yeah, sure, Andrew. Uh, workers continue to have obligations under the WHS Act, including when working from home. 
So these involve taking reasonable care for their own health and safety, complying so far as they are reasonably able with any reasonable instructions given by their employer, cooperating with any reasonable policy or procedure of the employer relating to health and safety, and uh, importantly, notifying their manager or supervisor of any work-related incidents which occur, including those that occur in the home. Additionally, workers have obligations to report any changes that may affect their health and safety uh, when working from home. They must maintain a safe work environment, such as having a designated work area. For example, ensuring the work area is comfortable and has safe access, providing adequate lighting and ventilation, repairing any uneven surfaces or removing any trip hazards. They also need to manage their own in-house safety such as maintaining electrical equipment and installing and maintaining smoke alarms. Okay, thanks Justin. So it's really important to recognise that uh, all of us as workers have got responsibilities for work health and safety, not just employers, and it's something that each of us has to take uh, seriously. So just take a look at the poll results. It looks like it's about 50-50 between those people who have looked at uh, the content on our coronavirus webpage uh, and people who haven't yet but intend to in the future. So back to you, Natalie. And I understand that the current environment's highlighted quite a number of psychosocial risks that our workers may be experiencing. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us a bit about some of those. Yeah, absolutely, um, Andrew. Uh, psychosocial risks are really important and something that we shouldn't forget about during COVID-19. There's been a complete shift in the way that we've worked and we've talked about that today already with so many people working from home. And management of our psychosocial risks, as long as, uh, along with physical, should play a major role in our decision making and actions in response to the pandemic. Some of the psychosocial risks our workers and even ourselves may be experiencing during this time include um, increased work demand. Um, for many, work has to add, we've had to adjust our work, um, we've had to change and rapidly change increasing work demands um, and increasing um, requirements in terms of the work that we need to do. But on the flip side, we're also hearing about low job demand. Uh, usual work may have changed or even reduced, impacting on worker satisfaction. And there may also this may also impact on a worker's um, mental health and wellbeing, particularly as we start to hear about job insecurity as, um, as the economic conditions deteriorate. There's all, we're also hearing about a breakdown or lack of communication where workers are working in isolation or maybe feeling like they're having a sense of reduced support or feeling more isolated from colleagues and from their work environment. We also know that many businesses are doing it really tough and that workplaces are experiencing a significant amount of organisational change. Managing change and risks in a rapidly changing environment like COVID-19 uh, we absolutely understand is really hard, but it's really important and ultimately it is a duty under the Work Health and Safety Act that employers talk regularly to their workers and understand both the physical and psychosocial risks that are present and emerging. Some risks may be unique in your workplace or your industry, um, but, but we need to assess the risk and properly mitigate them. Thanks, Natalie. So, I understand that there's some psychosocial risks that could affect workers that are not necessarily work related. Can you talk us through some of those also? Yes, yeah, sure, Andrew. Uh, during the time of uncertainty and change, there are many risks associated with our mental health and, role, and well-being as a result of COVID-19. While they not all, may not all be work related, our workers can directly or indirectly um, be impacted from a partner or a family member. And it's really important for managers to consider these. People may be struggling with feelings of uncertainty, stress, anxiety, and others may be adjusting to self-isolation or longer periods of working from home or just away from their teams and their colleagues. Also, our home and our family life may have gone through a significant change. Our previous daily routines no longer exist and for some, this has been really confronting. So some of the risks um, that we need to be mindful of that are not necessarily work-related. Um, so financial stress, and that's a big one right now. There's something we're hearing a lot about given the current economic environment. Fatigue, 
Uh, I already spoke about this before, but definitely in terms of that is emerging with the increase in cognitive load and increase in, in, in screen time. Balancing work and caring responsibilities, so that's one dear to my heart. Um, homeschooling, um, having less access to before and after school care and other supports. Um, they may also include things like caring for vulnerable family members and friends, certainly with the um, emergence of the aged care issues that we're starting to hear about. I know that that is very stressful for some families. Um, we also have seen changes in our activities that would usually support our mental health. So, for example, going to the gym, exercising, working outdoors without a mask, uh, social supports, meeting for dinners and so on and so forth. And for some of us, we can't do that right now. There are also, unfortunately, too many reports that we are hearing around increase of exposure to domestic violence um, that has been escalating during the COVID-19 period. And so that's something too, as employers, we need to be mindful of. Thanks, Natalie. So although those risks may not be necessarily work-related, we, of course, do need to consider them and think about how they might be affecting our workers and their health and safety. Now, the team's asked me to mention that we've got a lot of questions coming through uh, and we'll be answering uh, more on our resources page that we'll be sending out once the link uh, to that is ready. Now, the ones that we have had come through uh, the registration process have been asking around what guidance and support are available for employers after work with mental health and assist workers uh, through the challenging times and to help mitigate those associated risks. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, it's, that's a really important question. Uh, we have all been accommodating to change over the last few months, and it certainly hasn't been easy. We should be constantly maintaining a good level of communications with our workers and within our teammates through a variety of channels that are available to us. Supervisors and managers should also look out for and be conscious of changes in workers' mood and their performance. And there may be early signs that someone's not doing so well and will enable them to intervene early if necessary and appropriate. Homecare has also developed some excellent guidance material to help look after your own mental health and that of your workers. So some of the topics that we've looked to cover off are guidance for parents and carers, the importance of physical health and the impact that that can have on our mental health. Um, supporting others through times of uncertainty and distress. And that's something certainly that we've heard, particularly for those workers that are at the front line at the moment and, and delivering essential services to their own communities, that they are seeing a lot of distress and uncertainty um, and also just responding to uncertainty um, more broadly. Um, I'd also like to highlight that some of our partners, such as Beyond Blue, have further resources and also have a national hotline available to anyone who may need support. Um, we can make those resources available too on our website. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, so yeah, I'll reinforce that uh, by pointing out that all of the resources that we'll be referring to today will be sent uh, to you in a link to a resources page uh, that relates to this webinar. Now, Natalie, there's been a bit of talk about a mental health and wellbeing pandemic response plan. Can you tell us how this relates? Absolutely, Andrew. Uh, the National Cabinet has endorsed uh, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic, pandemic Response Plan, and this has really been dri driven by the National Mental Health Commission. It's a reflection of the importance that we need to respond to the psychosocial risks that have been brought to the forefront due to COVID-19 including the impacts from an economic downturn through um, loss of income and jobs and uncertainty of the future. It's also really important to highlight that all states and territories have endorsed and embraced um, the plan. So um, it will be a really uh, a big one to watch moving forward. OK, great. Thanks, Natalie, for those uh, insights on both the physical and the psychosocial risks uh, during this uh, really challenging time. It might be interesting uh, to actually do another thumb poll on how the pandemic has weighed on uh, you, the audience's mental health and well-being. Uh, has it uh, had a negative effect, a positive effect, both positive and negative, or hasn't had much um, effect influence? So we've talked a bit about working from home, uh, but as we know, a large proportion of our jurisdiction has continued to work in their normal workplace, particularly those in frontline or operational organisations, agencies and businesses. And those workers may be experiencing other hazards and risks. I'm wondering if uh, you can talk to some of those. 
Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, workers who have remained in the physical workplace, uh, especially those in frontline roles, may have seen changes to risks and hazards that they are facing. Some of them we're hearing played out in the media, and some of them include things like an increase in client aggression or occupational violence, with some workplaces experiencing higher levels of aggression than usual, including physical and verbal assault. Discrimination, racism or stigma stemming from COVID-19. Environmental hazards, for example, being concerned or worried about being exposed to COVID-19 virus at work itself and the transmission to others. Feelings of anxiousness or worry about not having the right equipment or training, um, like PPE, and we certainly saw that in the early days of the pandemic and hopefully we've got that sorted now. As well as a breakdown or deterioration of workplace relationships that may um, increase in uh, workplace bullying, aggression or harassment as people feel the strain and stress of an increased workload or even on job insecurity. Okay. I'm just looking at that uh, poll on how the influence of mental health and wellbeing. And really interestingly, uh, we've got uh, definitely got some people who had uh, reporting a negative effect, um, maybe a few less with a positive effect, but a large number of people who are acknowledging that it's had both positive and a negative effect with over 100 uh, respondents saying it's had both a positive um, and negative um, effect. Uh, so which is really, really interesting. So one of the attendees, Natalie, has also asked about where they can go for more information on work health safety duties uh, to manage uh, occupational violence. Uh, where can they go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Safe Work Australia's website, um, there is a, a COVID-19 or coronavirus hub there, is an excellent um, source and has really detailed information about how to identify, assess and manage risk in relation to work-related violence. Um, there's also specific sections broken up by industry type. So you can look for your industry type um, and then that guidance is specific for your industry. You can also look at the Commonwealth Code of Practice, um, how to manage work health and safety risks. Again, these resources can be made available after today's webinar. Um, it might be worth doing another thumbs up poll while we're in the mood um, and just seeing how many people have actually already visited the coronavirus um, related information that's on the Safe Work Australia website. Okay, great. So the team will be putting that up uh, as we speak. Uh, uh, we mentioned that we'll be putting up all of those resources and materials uh, and sending out to participants after the webinar. Now, before we move on to discussions about transitioning back into the physical workplace, the last uh, question on this particular topic is, with so much uh, information about, uh, where do you go for a trusted sources of information? Uh, how do I know I'm looking at the right thing? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, you're absolutely right. There are many sources of information and resources available right now. Firstly, it is really important um, that we look at credible sources of information, and that doesn't include Facebook. We also need to look follow local and state public health information, which includes controls and restrictions, recognising that these are changing regularly and our decision making and actions need to be agile um, as we respond to these. A recent example of this has been um, obviously in Victoria with the mandatory requirement of, uh, of wearing masks and also the rapid change back to isolation, um, which we've also seen. If you're in the Comcare scheme, our Comcare's website is home to many resources and links. You can also head to Safe Work Australia's website, as I've said before, which has specific guidance on all industries and how to manage different hazards and risks as they present. Uh, you'll also find some of the Australian Government Department websites hold really valuable sources of um, guidance and information, which includes the Australian Public Service Commission, the National COVID Coordination Commission, the Department of Health and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie, for talking us through those uh, risks uh, presented by COVID-19 and, of course, noting that uh, the list is in no way exhaustive. Uh, the thumb poll, uh, so a lot of people have accessed the Safe Work Australia materials and we have plenty of people who might not have yet, but do intend to uh, in the future. Uh, so transitioning workers back into the workplace, we're going to shift back to Justin. Um, Guidance uh, for conducting risk assessments has been another question that's been frequently asked through the health desk. 
Justin, what is employers, what do employers need to consider when they're transitioning workers back into physical workplaces? Uh, thanks, Andrew. So I think the first point to make here is that uh, Australia's state and territories are currently in different stages of restrictions and therefore transitioning back into the workplace will not be consistent across the country. So your transition plans will need to be individually tailored to each specific uh, state or territory that you're operating in. With that said, uh, Safe Work Australia's website has some excellent information relevant to uh, many industry sectors as they transition back to the usual workplace. There's information and guidance on risk assessments, emergency plans, physical distancing, cleaning and disinfecting, as well as hygiene procedures. It's also really important that your uh, transition plan focuses on the continued delivery of critical functions to ensure your workplaces are safe for everyone. Thanks, Justin. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could explore that a uh, little bit more deeply for us. Um, what are some of the considerations that employers need to um, look at when they're developing those plans? Sure. So following on from the previous question and noting that plans need to be individually tailored, I think that the diversity of working environments in the ComCare jurisdiction means a single approach is just not practical. So this means that each organisation's transition plan will also need to be tailored to the particular circumstances of that organisation. This may mean if you have workers, for instance, in different geographical locations, you may need to have multiple plans to cater to the public health directions issued in each of those locations. These plans will need to be flexible and agile enough to respond to outbreaks and changes in circumstances, and they need to be developed in consultation with HSRs and workers. Lastly, employers should use information from Comcare and Safe Work Australia's websites, as well as advice from the relevant Department of Health and the National COVID Coordination Commission to assist in developing these plans. Okay, thanks, Justin. Uh, and we've had a couple of questions about the clarifying the 1.5 metre um, rule. Uh, that's about measuring between workstations. Uh, it's uh, it isn't specifically outlined in the material uh, and the poster should uh, poster implies shoulder to shoulder, two arms. Am I reading that correctly? So the question was, can you clarify how the 1.5 metre rule is to be measured for workstations? This isn't specifically outlined in the material uh, and the poster implies uh, shoulder to shoulder or is it two arms length? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So there appears to be some confusion around applying the physical distancing uh, rules. The 1.5 metre physical distancing requirements relate to maintaining the distance between people to reduce the likelihood of exposure to micro droplets and others, not the physical distance between desks. So you measure it between the people involved. Uh, however, employers must also consider the four square metre rule uh, together with the 1.5 metre physical distancing requirement. So employers will need to make sure there's four square metres in the workplace per person, as well as ensuring that workers are 1.5 metres apart where possible. So there's a calculation involved for employers in that. Yeah. What, yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, Justin. Uh, so uh, other questions that have come in around uh, what needs to be discussed with workers when they're uh, creating and implementing the transition plans, uh, turning back to the workplace or out of workplace? Sure. As we've been saying today, when managing any risks, consultation with workers is a must. So employers should be discussing uh, and considering things like who needs to be in the physical workplace, can you prioritise your workforce that needs to be in the physical workplace? You need to consider the personal circumstances of workers. For instance, those who are classified as vulnerable workers or someone might have someone in their household who is. Do you have workers who have caring responsibilities for children or other family members? You'll need to respond to localised outbreaks and uh, where they impact the workplace and your operations. You'll also need to consider how you might modify workplace attendance arrangements to manage those physical distancing requirements. For example, can you look at staggered start or finish times, alternate rostering of, of staff across your business or working from home arrangements? So I really want to highlight here that conducting and reviewing risk assessments is critical 
to your successful response to this pandemic. And indeed, it's a fundamental obligation under the WHS Act. Thanks, Justin. Uh, and another thumb poll that we might also put up is around that uh, for those people who have uh, worked from home during COVID-19, we had a preference uh, to working from home, uh, working from the office or preferring a mix of both. Uh, so another question that's come in from the Work Health Safety Help Desk has been asking around, uh, can workers be directed to return to the office or to stay at home? Uh, again, to you, Justin. Yeah, thanks again, Andrew. So uh, whether workers return to the usual workplace environment or a different workplace environment or continue to work from home is a matter for the individual organisation. There's not a one size fits all response I can give to that question. As I've mentioned, states and territories will be in different stages at different times. So if your organisation operates across multiple jurisdictions, you will in all likelihood need to be have different arrangements and be mindful of those particular requirements in each location. As we've discussed, assessing which workers need to be in the workplace is really important. And taking into consideration the nature of work, as well as the individual circumstances that apply. So just to note, uh, this answer is based on WHS requirements. Workers and employers should also seek advice from the Fair Work Ombudsman around pay and leave entitlements uh, with workers being directed back to a physical workplace. Okay, great. So um, maybe it's worth cracking open then, uh, what are the considerations that workplaces need to have when, they, uh, when they're in the physical workplace? Yep, sure. So employers in consultation need to consider the industry and nature of the work that is being completed. So this might include things like what lessons the organisation has learned from responding to COVID-19 so far, how flexible working arrangements have worked for that organisation. Uh, would, for instance, a mixed mode of office and home-based work uh, apply into the future? Is that an appropriate treatment? You should also consider how will physical distancing work in your workplace? For example, how will team meetings occur? And how will you reinforce and promote good hygiene practices and physical distancing? You'll also need to direct workers to not attend the workplace when feeling unwell and have a plan in place to manage when a worker is showing symptoms at work. Risk assessments will also need to be completed or updated if a new risk arises. As, uh, along with any related policies and procedures. And lastly, consider individual flexible working arrangements based on identified vulnerabilities, carers' responsibilities, workers' concerns, and organisational requirements. Natalie, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight here? Thanks, Justin. Uh, just a couple of points that I'd like to reinforce that you've already made about the importance of communication and consultation. So change and uncertainty can be a significant stressor for some, therefore updates from an employer. So just regular communication, even if you don't have anything to really say the situation hasn't changed, it can be really important as it provides assurance to workers about what is actually happening. Workers should discuss options for return to usual workplace environments with their managers and what this will look like in the short term as well as in the longer term arrangements noting that the usual workplace environment will, for many organisations, continue to be the primary place of work. It is critical for employers to really understand the workplace risks and hazards and that they consult with their workers to genuinely understand what those hazards and risks look like in operation and consequences uh, of any risk mitigation that's taken place. We've also talked a lot in the discussion today about identifying and assessing and implementing controls around risks. Uh, it's really important for employers to consult with workers on these elements, but also in evaluating the effectiveness of these controls as this situation continues to evolve. Using staff surveys, polls like we've done today are a really good opportunity for workers to provide feedback on policies and procedures and are an example of how communicating and, consult and consultation can be done whilst working um, remotely. 
Okay, thanks, Natalie. So, Justin, before we go to um, to wrap up this section, uh, I'll get you to quickly mention some of the other considerations that employers need to have before transitioning uh, workers back into the workplace or as the situation evolves. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So we've provided a lot of information today on the considerations that employers need to be taking to ensure the health and safety of workers and others. This situation is ever evolving and we just won't know what's coming next. Our transition plans and our controls need to be reviewed regularly. Our plans and actions need to be sustainable, but also able to respond to outbreaks or changes to any circumstances that the workplace is, uh, is, is experiencing. Maintaining safe workplaces depends on employers and workers working together. Both parties need to observe the essential safety messages around good physical hygiene, physical distancing, uh, staying safe, staying home if unwell, and following the risk management process when changes take place or when new hazards or risks arise. Employers also need to have a regular reporting flow that captures compliance with the plan and how you respond to any incidents that arise. Keeping records of any consultation, procedures, or changes to work instructions is incredibly important, along with details of any training completed by workers and things like infection control and PPE use in your organisation. And finally, having a strong cleaning regime, with this being reviewed regularly and adjusted where necessary to reflect the local circumstances and local health advice is incredibly important too. Great. Uh, thanks, Justin and Natalie, for all of your insights and responding to all those uh, questions. Uh, we might uh, wrap up by just throwing you sort of one last question, which is about the biggest insight or learning that you've had from this uh, pandemic experience today. So there's one or two key points uh, that you've had from the pandemic experience uh, to start. Justin? Okay, thanks, Andrew. First observation is that people and workplaces are adaptable. I've been incredibly uh, impressed by the responsiveness of uh, in workplaces to this hitherto unknown uh, workplace hazard and risk. There's been an amazing response from the technology, the working from home, the risk assessments, new job roles and the like. So that's uh, that's been really positive uh, for me. And that shows me that the principles in the WHS Act are sound and effective. Um, we've been talking a lot about HSRs and consultation. Uh, I've seen a lot of that and uh, we've stressed that a lot today. That needs to continue. And the last point I'd make is it's really important that you document uh, your controls and the risk assessments that you're undertaking and any changes to your procedures. Absolutely fundamental that you do that. So thanks, Andrew. And thanks, everyone. Thanks. thanks, Justin. And Natalie? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, so for me, uh, human beings are really resilient. If we look back in time, there has been other times in history where we have seen uh, pandemics, major uh, challenges to the human race, um, and I guess this is this is one. And I guess to we've not only seen workplaces change and adapt and evolve, but as human beings, we can evolve and we can adapt, and we need to remain positive on that. Um, and I guess the other key takeaway for me is that we've been talking for a long time in the research around the future of work. I guess what I want to say is my observation is the future of work is now and we need to stop talking about it like it's something that's going to happen. It really is here now and we really need to be embracing those disruptions to our workplace and thinking about what does that mean for our workplaces now and into the future and how workplaces need to continue to adapt to meet the new challenges. But they also bring new opportunities as well and we really need to think about what's going to support a productive and thriving workplace uh, now and into the future as well. So thanks, Andrew. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, both Natalie and Justin, for taking a ride on the hot seats, uh, answering our audience questions and giving us your uh, insights. Before everyone goes, I'm really happy to announce that Comcare is continuing to work on enhancing its education and engagement offer with new content and digital options. We're looking to do more webinars in the future on topics that you're interested in. So please give us your feedback.